Hello, everybody, and welcome to a Friday. Friday Fundamentalist Fails. I love to see you all. Good to see you all here. Um, today's one is a weird one, but I, I have to talk just briefly. And uh, if you are here for new, basically, this is a segment where an atheist like me goes through some of the claims, some of the things from all kinds of fundamentalists, whether that be Christian fundamentalists or Muslim fundamentalists or just fundamentalists in spirituality or anything where they are sort of um, sort of just, just fundamentalist in their mentality. Um, and we go through and we just sort of pick it apart and find out if, you know, whether they're there or where they're actually going wrong. But um, it is it is fantastic to see you all. And, and thank you for joining me for this Friday. I noticed that that's probably Thursday night for everybody else in, in the uh, US. But uh, yeah, it's my Friday. So um, I get to I get to um, look at look at videos of fundamentalists on a Friday and find out where they failed, which is fantastic. Uh, too many, too, too much alliteration in that one. Uh, way too much alliteration. And today we have um, a guy that I've been keeping an eye on. Now, um, this guy's name is Joe Kirby. Um, he's English um, sort of evangelical um, from Off the Curb Ministries. And he's got like 2.3 million subscribers. So he's actually very, very massive. He's a massive, massive um youtuber and um i think that i i don't think he deserves um what he has and I, i'm not saying that out of sort of jealousy or some kind of petty revenge but he doesn't seem to check or care about the truth of his statements he doesn't actually care whether what he's saying is has any basis in fact whatsoever and um it, it's very um it's very suspicious in the way that he's not just wrong but categorically abysmally and tragically wrong about everything that he says and he will put these things up and i, I want to use this video which um when did it come out three weeks ago so just under a month ago and keep that in mind for this this video um i do have to just before i start i, I will sort of make an apology i sort of missed um um the last open room that i was going to do um i i i do apologize I've, I've been feeling very frazzled over the last week um some things have come up in my personal life some some stuff has happened and i haven't i i've sort of felt a bit frayed so i kind of i i took a day to sort of just just you know get it together just just not put pressure on myself um part of part of sort of um being kind to myself a little bit um and and certainly this week's been very very tough and very very um stressful for me but you know i i think that that it's important that when we're going through times like that we kind of go well it's not going to last forever you know you're going to feel better again you just have to get through that that point so um yeah I, i'm back at it and and i'm, I'm really happy to be here because these ones usually are um I mean, usually, I mean, they're, they're usually pretty funny, um, just just the amount they can get wrong. But th this is this is a guy that I really want to, um, I guess, pick on. Sorry, Joe. Sorry, Joe Kirby. I want to pick on you a bit more because his his audience is so large and the information he gives is so wrong, like so horribly wrong that I, uh, I I feel like I, I should be doing something, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, it, it's very, very strange. Um, yeah, but we'll probably um, get, yeah, yeah, like I, as, as, as uh, Beams has pointed out, the, the Hovens is a, is a unit of measurement for the statements of, uh, that are wrong per, per minute. So um, this guy will probably get at least a few hovens. Um, but, you know, the, look, Kent wishes he pulled the amount of audience this guy did, but it's, it's actually very funny. So I'll get this lined up. And it's not an overly long clip, but there's probably a lot to pick out of it and go through. Um, so I will. So as you can see, this is from Off the Curb Ministries. Um, and of course, don't forget, as always, um, the the copyright disclaimer. Um, 
allowances made for yes, fair use, such as criticism, comment, news reporting, uh, teaching, scholarship, and education. I think education is very, um, very um, important because he's mis he's sending out misinformation. Um, so it, it's very important that we kind of point this out. Does anybody know what theory he's talking about? You want to have a guess at which theory is evil? Want to have a wild guess there? Anybody? Anybody guess? No? Well, let's see if we can find out. Let's see if we can find out which which theory that is the evil theory that is, yeah, yeah, flying, flying spaghetti theory, absolutely. So it, it always makes me funny. Uh, it always makes me laugh, and I, I find it funny when people say, and I'll just, uh, whoops, that's not the one I'm after. Um, hmm. It, when people say, um, you know, that 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 theory is evil, right? This theory is evil. A theory is just a model of reality. Like, that's all it is. Like, it, it's sort of like saying, oh, the theory of gravity is evil. Well, no, a, a theory can't be evil. Like, it just can't be. Like, it, it's just a model of reality. That's all. Like, so calling evolutionary theory evil is like saying well gravity the theory of gravity is evil look newton say newton's theory of gravity it's not the most accurate it's just a model though it's not evil and it's not good it's just it's either accurate or inaccurate or you know i, I think that they need to really um really understand that scientific theories are not moral pronouncements like we're not saying that that evolution is a good thing like we're not saying that like this 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 is you know we should for instance they always go well if you think evolution's true then you should slaughter everybody that you know to in order to no that's that's not not uh, you know that's not necessarily a good thing you're not understanding that this theory is describing a reality it's or, or our physical world our natural world around us not prescribing something as something you ought to do you ought to like that's not what we're doing here but let's go the evil theory the evolution I mean, yeah. okay now this has got people outraged because what this little guy will do next is going to cause big problems for a certain group of people if there was one creature yeah, so this this is obviously, and, and from the Toad's reaction, this is a Bombardier beetle. So they basically make chemicals that um, cause an, uh, an exothermic reaction that, um, pro, you know, makes heat and is, is um, in, insanely uh, vitriolic to the, to the predator. Um, they'll try to eat them and they'll produce these chemicals that, you know, they'll spit them out because they're absolutely horrible. Creature in the animal kingdom that causes evolutionists to question their entire theory. It would no, no, they don't. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't cause evil. And I love how he uses the term evolutionist. Evolution, like, dude, it's evolution. Like, seriously, evolutionist. It would be the bombardier beetle. How can I make such a massive claim? Well, you will too when you see what's inside these beetles. When you see what's inside these beetles. So the first thing that, that got me is, why does this man talk like this? Why does he talk like this? This is this is so weird. Um, he, like, he talks in such a weird way. I'll, I'll let it go for a bit further. But seriously, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's really really odd fix your eyes on this the bombardier beetle contains a masterpiece of engineering design it has glands in its belly that produce two safe chemicals when kept apart hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide but get this the beetle then sends these chemicals into a sort of yeah so um i just want to switch over yeah so so it, it does produce hydroquinone and um hydrogen peroxide which which combine to make this caustic fluid now um look he, he sort of um 
he sort of says, well, this this is this is obviously designed. And what reason do we have for thinking that? Like all insects produce quinone. It's that horrible smell that you get when when you sort of you know squish it. Storage tank where it keeps them for a rainy day. So let's see what happens when the bombardier beetle spots trouble ahead. Once unhappy, the beetle, using a complex valve system, sends these two chemicals into another uniquely designed chamber. And from there, the beetle secretes a special catalyst of enzymes, which when mixed with the two chemicals, create an overpowering spray, which is 100 degrees Celsius. Right, so now we have this scalding hot spray. It's ready. So the bomber beer beetle, he sizes up his enemy, he twists his lower body, and then rotates the two nozzles at his tail end. And with precise accuracy, he erupts his insane combination at anyone who dares to to mess with him. And the craziest thing of all is the bombardier beetle lets out not just one, not just two booms, but 500 booms per second to ensure that he is nobody's lunch today. So come on, let's ask the obvious question here. Why does this leave the evolutionist speechless? It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. The 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 the, the um, evolution of the, the bombardier beetle is, is pretty well outlined. Like it's not, it's not like this thing where we've got no idea how it came about kind of thing. Um, um, it, it, it's pretty well known, and I found the, the complete breakdown. Now, the, the, the thing about this is that um, the thing about this is um, this, this wasn't his, uh, like, he didn't just come off ab about this spur of the moment. Like, if you think that, that you know, Joe... Kirby, you know, investigated and came up with this. Of course he didn't. Of course he didn't. This was actually something that was proposed by Gish. Well, I mean, it was Behe first, but Gish, like literally the Gish of the Gish Gallop um, was the one that made this his personal favourite and really, really pushed it kind of thing. Um, so Behe came up with if you're unfamiliar with Behe, he's the guy that came up with the irreducible complexity argument. And he left it open as to whether the Bombardier beetle um, was irreducible, irreducibly complex or not. But Gish doubled down on it and said, no, it is absolutely the thing. And, and exactly what he's saying. Oh, it leaves evolutionists dumbfounded. There's no real such thing as evolutionists. It's just scientists. And they're not. That's the thing. Um, and, I mean, but this is an argument from uh, nineteen ninety six. You know, this this is this is so old an argument and has been so debunked. But of course, Joe Kirby doesn't care. He doesn't care that we've got a breakdown of how this um, um, has actually came about. Behe, okay. Cool. Well, B, he's just, I mean, he's, he's, his irreducible complexity is so um, debunked by now, like sort of, it, it just doesn't exist. He's never pointed to one thing that's irreducibly complex ever. Um, so I found this and, and sort of, this is so old. I found it on a Talk Origins archive. It's literally been archived. It's that old. Um, it, it is a, such an old argument. It's sort of originated sort of back in the 80s, 90s, where it, when it sort of came about. Um, so Gish was absolutely wrong. The, the, the evolution, and it's a step-by-step -step evolution, it's not that hard to envisage, right? It's not that hard to put sort of, to look at other beetles that have diverged and go, oh, they've got this system or this system in place, and this one has got this system. Here is how it could have come about very easily. So quinones are produced by uh, epidermal cells for tanning the cuticle. It exists very commonly in arthropods. So that chemical is sort of all throughout the arthropod world. There's world of insects, that chemical exists. Some of the quinones don't get used up, but sit on the epidermis, so that sit on the sits on the skin, making the arthropod distasteful. So that's sort of um, it, it's used as defensive secretion to make them taste bad, kind of thing, to make them taste awful. Um, small 
intervaginitis, uh, so small uh, uh, grooves develop in the epidermis between the sclerites or the plates of the cuticle. By wriggling, the insect can squeeze more quinones onto its surface when they're needed. So basically just grooves develop that they can push out some more of this chemical to, to, um, to um, make them make the, the per thing eating them um, sort of less less appetizing to the things eating them. The, the grooves deepen, muscles are moved around slightly, allowing them to help expel the quinones from some of them. Many ants have glands similar to this near the end of their abdomen. So even just ants um, have the ability to use muscles to um, produce more of this chemical. And, and we sort of, you know, um, we, we sort of he, uh, smell this um, in, in, in ants when, when you sort of squish them with also pheromones that, that sort of, um, uh, that, that, you know, alert them to danger. Um, uh, a couple of these gaps become, uh, they're now reservoirs, become so deep that the others are inconsequential by comparison. Those gradually revert to the original epidermis. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about evolution. There's sort of an idea that, um, for instance, you have the table analogy, which says, oh, well, how did the table develop four legs? If you take one away, it won't work as a table kind of thing. Um, and you can't put the, the, the top on without the legs having been developed. Well, what you can actually do is sort of develop with multiple supports and then take those supports away. There, there's a way that, that these things develop where um, things develop so another um, system is produced and then the things that develop that the the that produce that system are actually taken away. So it's not in uh, uh, um, um, irreducibly complex if it had other systems to support it in the past. Um, in various insects, different defensive chemicals besides quinones appear. Uh, this is like links to a paper. Those helps insects defend against predators which have evolved resistance to quinones. One of those new defensive chemicals is hydroquinone. So that's the one of the chemicals. Cells secrete hydroquinones develop in multiple layers over part of the reservoir, allowing more hydroquinones to be produced. Channels between cells allow hydroquinones from all layers to reach the reservoir. The channels become a duct specialized for um, transporting chemicals. The secretory cells withdraw from the reservoir surface, ultimately becoming a separate organ. This stage, secretory glands connected by ducts to reservoirs exist in many beetles. The particular configuration of glands and reservoirs that Bombardier beetles have in common have is common to other beetles of that suborder. Muscles adapt, which close off the reservoir thus preventing the chemicals from leaking out when they're not needed. So all of this, all of this system evolves first or evolves sort of in other beetles. So we can see this from the other beetles in their um, groups. And, and we have to acknowledge the hierarchical structure of this sort of it's, you know, all insects or most insects produce quinones of a certain order. These ones become more specialized and more specialized and more specialized. Um, uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is a common byproduct of cellular metabolism, becomes mixed with the hydroquinones. The two re react slowly, so a mixture of quinones and hydroquinones get used for the de defense. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I can, I can share this tab. Just a second. Oh, I just, I'm, you know what? I'm worried about the sound being lost when, when I move back kind of thing for some reason it 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 sort of the sound gets lost and i don't know why it it it, it drives me crazy with this this program but never mind let's push on um cells secreting a small amount of catalysis and peroxides appear along the output passage of the reservoir outside the valve which closes it off from outside these ensure that more quinones appear in the defensive secretions 
Catalases exist in almost all cells and peroxidases are common in plants, animals and bacteria. So these chemicals needn't be developed from scratch at merely concentrated in one location. More catalysts and peroxidases there are produced so the discharge is warmer and expelled faster by the ox oxygen generated by the reaction. There is another beetle um, which, which uh, Metrius contractus provides an example of a Bombardier beetle which produces a foamy discharge and not jets. Okay, so it just produces a fine mist. Um, the walls of that passage become firmer, allowing them to better withstand the heat and pressure generated by the reaction. Still more catalases and peroxidases are produced. The walls toughen, shape into a reaction chamber. Gradually, they become the mechanism of today's Bombardier beetles. The tip of the beetle's abdomen becomes somewhat elongated and more flexible, allowing the beetle to aim its discharge in various directions. And he really is overstating the accuracy of this. It's not... Um, not um, it, it, it's not incredibly hyper. It, it's accurate enough. It, it certainly is accurate for what the beetle needs it to do. But basically, what, what they're doing is they're basically going, well, look at all of this complex stuff. How did that just pop into existence? And it's it's sort of like, well, you're not like you're you're comparing it to, say, an engine or a cellular phone or something that has been made by humans. Evolution doesn't work like that. You, you, it doesn't just pop in with all its various parts working in tandem. We have these um, very more basic systems that are co-opted for another purpose or they become more complex over time and these systems develop together. That They think that it just, you know, pops from a beetle to having this system all at once and it doesn't. Nobody is saying that. Um, now I'm going to go back to the video. I'm going to be so upset if this this uh, doesn't doesn't work. I'll tell you why. When you look at this incredibly complex system, and you know that this is inside every single Bombardier Beetle, you have to admit that this system must be carefully designed because any no, like I, we've just run through. Step by step, oh, thank you guys, really appreciate it. Um, we've just run through step by step how it evolved. This can evolve. And the thing that, 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 um, oh, thank, thanks, Mark and, um, and, uh, uh Beheaded, really appreciate it. Beheaded, I thought you were working. I, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so w we can run step through it. And the thing that gives us the clue is we see other beetles in the same order, in the same group as these, or same, I hate to use the word, kind, maybe you'll understand that word, same kind that has similar things, but they're not the same. They're, they're simplified versions of them or alternative versions of them. That They sort of have, um, and then as we go back through the evolutionary hierarchy, we can see like, the quinones, but no hydrogen peroxide sort of creation, right? So we see, say, the, the other beetle, which has the hydrogen peroxide and the hydroquinone, but it doesn't have the, the muscles in the chamber in order to expel it as much, so it expels it as a foam. When we go back, <laughs> no, no worries, beheaded. Thanks, thanks, mate. Um, as we go back, we see that, um, sort of through the hierarchy of evolution, we see that, hey, this one just produces the quinone, but it has the muscles to force it to the surface. This one just has the, the, the hydroquinone. And then as we go back up to very unrelated insects or arthropods, um, like it will just have the quinone, not even hydroquinone. Like we, we see this development through um, the thing. It, it's not mystifying as this guy is saying. Any system involving combustion and the fusion. It, it's not combustion, it's chemical. It, it's its chemical. It, it, it's not combustion. Um, so combustion would be if you lit it up kind of thing. It, it's a chemical reaction. Like he obviously... Okay, so... <laughs> um, and this is, this is, this is sort of... Um, um, it 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 doesn't it it doesn't um 
I mean, I, I'm not sure if it would count as combustion. I thought it had to react with oxygen to be combustion. Um, but it, it's not it's not like combustion like in a car or something. It's just a chemical reaction, that's all. Yeah, exothermic. Yeah, you're right, Mark. It is exothermic, isn't it? Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah, it's exothermic. It's it's not combustion because it's not reacting with oxygen and having an ignition. It's it's you know it's a chemical reaction. Uh, I mean, technically, you know, any reaction is chemical, but um, it, it's it's not combustion. Fusion of two powerful chemicals must have a mind behind it. Why? The fusion of two chemicals must have a mind behind it. No. Not th th there's there's chemicals going through your body constantly. I don't understand how two chemicals like there's chemical reactions in nature all the time. Literally all the time. I, I don't get how that must have a mind. The 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 combination of water, well water vapor and um, um, uh, uh, hydrogens in the air, like can make acid rain. Like I, I don't, I, I don't understand how that requires a mind. Like you can you can make this sort of statement that yes, yeah, a sulfuric or nitric acid. Yeah, I. I, I you know, so so nitrogen or, or sulfur in the atmosphere can can yeah, it, it's so weird that you'd say that. Like this is the kind of thing, it's it's like a deepity. It sounds significant. Well, this you know, two significant chemicals reacting requires a mind. No, it doesn't. Because because acid rain happens and that's just a chemical reaction. It doesn't require a mind. Chemicals famously don't require a mind for reaction. Because anyone who works with combustion knows that many things can go. It, it's exothermic, not combustion. Easily wrong. I mean, think about it. If evolution is step-by-step, -step, gradual, unguided changes over millions of years, that means that at some points in the Bombardier Beetle's history, it had no chemical spray. So what happened the first time that it mixed these two chemicals? When it didn't have any storage tank, and it didn't have anywhere to hold it, how would it store this 100 degrees mixture? And how did it manage to eject and release this spray if it hadn't yet evolved these two nozzles at its tail end? And then the other... Yeah, so this is this is the misunderstanding. This is This is what I was pointing out earlier. He thinks that they went in one step from having no um, um, exothermic defensive reaction to a full-fledged Bombardier Beetle sort of, you know, mix of the chemicals all at once. Like just, just you know, a, a, a Bombardier Beetle was born with this when previously it had none of the constituent components. Like... Um, it, it, it's so weird that they think this is how evolution works. That, you know, um, if, if a Bombardier beetle has developed this, then, you know, uh, what its mother didn't. And suddenly, the, the like, no, this is not. It, it's a very, very, very slow process. Oh, boy. And the other thing that's got me thinking is what about the storage chambers when they were evolving? How did the first storage chambers have the durability, the thickness not to melt whilst holding this red hot fusion? Come on. Because it wasn't a red hot fusion. As we as as we saw in that breakdown explanation, basically it had a very, very um it, it added a tiny amount of, of hydrogen peroxide to make it a bit more spicy, for lack of a better word but not, it wasn't this furious mixture that you're trying to describe. Um, it became that way over time. It, it didn't just, you know, suddenly have these things. Come on, guys, you know as well as I do that if left a chance without all of these parts fully made and fully functioning together, this beetle would burst into a thousand pieces the first time it ever attempted to make its own rocket fuel. Do they know that, like, it, you know... It, 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 it attempted to make its own. A, it's not rocket fuel. It's just a chemical react. Like, come on now. I, I I don't know why he thinks that a beetle with none of these features just suddenly tried to make it and it worked. That's not how any of this works. 
we're talking when we're talking evolution we're talking about populations and we're talking about successive generations like it didn't just have a a beetle that decided oh well i'm going to mix these two chemicals and see what happens um It is kind of obvious, isn't it, that such a fragile... It, it's not obvious. And yeah, he calls it rocket fuel. Like, seriously, dude, no, it's not rocket... Like, oh, boy. ...combustion system must require an intelligent designer. Because if you remove any part of the system, it would be impossible for the Bombardier Beetle to survive, as it would either destroy itself or it wouldn't... Have and, and see how he says the gas is 212 Fahrenheit. I believe, don't, don't get me wrong, but I think that's only like about 100 degrees Celsius. Um, yeah, that's 100 degrees Celsius. That's the same as boiling water. That, that's the same as boiling water. Okay, 100 Celsius is boiling water. It's not that hot. Um, like, there's a whole thing of an explosion is, is not that hot. Yeah, it's hot because, you know, boiling water is hot, but it's not like, you know, um, a rocket fuel exp explosion. You know, so, so, um, I mean, your average sort of um, rocket fuel explosion is going to be thousands of degrees. It's not, it's not that hot. Um, and, and the chemicals are caustic. That's why we sort of um, say it, 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 it's not like he's been fooled by the name of Bombardier Beetle, um, that, that he thinks it, it releases this explosive stuff that explodes. It doesn't explode. It's hot and it's caustic, right? Caustic as in acidic. It's not an explosion. Like this, this is just, and I love how he's got the doves here. They're so important to the Christians. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not that you're thinking it's like, uh, well, rocket fuel, and somebody's lighting it up, like it causes an explosion. No, no, it's just hot caustic liquid from an exothermic reaction. You're totally misrepresenting it. But he doesn't care, of course. You know, he's he's listening to a uh, Behe, and um, yeah wouldn't have the tools to protect itself from any bigger animals and thus would not survive and would not pass on its genes and we would not have bombardier beetles today but i can yeah you idiot like that the, there is earlier versions of it that help the the beetle survive and the ones that had more and more caustic chemicals and developed better ways to distribute those chemicals to the predator were the ones that survived there's no problem with this there is absolutely no problem with this. I can hear exactly what you're saying right now. Big deal, Joe. So there's this one beetle which throws a curveball into the theory of evolution. That does not prove. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It 100% it, it doesn't throw any kind of curveball into the theory. Like, it doesn't. It absolutely does not. At the, the moment, is just sort of... Like, your lack of understanding of evolution and your lack of understanding of the development of the Bombardier beetle and the other beetles that have very similar traits but not as um, evolved in that direction as the Bombardier beetle, that doesn't throw a curveball into the theory. It's just you lack the knowledge to be able to understand the theory of evolution. Prove that intelligent design happened by a creator. Well, what if I told you that there are examples of what famously has been called irreducible complexity throughout the entire animal kingdom? And I'm going to show you some of these examples. But first, let's hear from the man himself, Charles Darwin, the author of evolution. He said... Yeah, so this is what Charles Darwin said. So, you know, usually you mischaracterize... They mischaracterize Darwin. You know, i got to say. Um... Usually they mischaracterize him, and and he wasn't he wasn't all knowing or anything. He didn't understand um, the the system in which those traits are passed from parent to child. He did not understand genetics. He did not understand genes. He did not understand chromosomes. There was a lot he didn't understand. But what he did get was visionary. He said there has to be a mechanism for passing down these traits. And there has to be these evolutionary pressures. That was the genius of Darwin. He didn't know what it was, but he knew it had to be there. 
And all this time later, we understand genetics so well, we understand what he was talking about because he concluded there had to be that system. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't, you know, sort of a, a, a um, you know, all-knowing guy. He just, you know, saw something, um, followed the evidence where it led, and concluded a number of things that turned out to be 100% right, 100% right. Hello, Robin. Welcome. There she is. Um, he said if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. I would yeah, he did say that, and that is true. Unfortunately, nobody has shown anything that could not be demonstrated to have come from small incremental steps. Um, like... You 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 don't understand that your your example is terrible because we understand how the Bombardier beetle developed this system, but you don't care to even look it up. You don't care to see the scientific explanation for it. All you care about is you've got an argument from well originally Behe, but you're really using Gish Gish's arguments. But so you're referencing Gish, uh, which is just terrible. This argument has been put to bed like ages ago because the, the creationists ended up looking foolish because we can actually point to other beetles with similar structures that are not as advanced or as not as evolved as the Bombardier beetle and say, hey, they, it evolved along these lines. But of course, you, you don't know because you didn't look. I wonder what goes through your mind as you hear that. that in that you're full of crap, that you are absolutely full of crap. We can break down the exact evolution of the Bombardier beetle. That's what goes through. And, and you know, this whole thing of, oh, if Darwin said it, yeah, you've yet to prove anything. In other words, the evolution daddy himself is saying that if there is one organism which can be proved that it does not evolve by tiny, slight modifications, then everything I've ever said is one big, fat lie. Well, and And we've yet to show that. We can show that the Bombardier beetle evolved through small incremental steps. That That is not a gotcha. And you're using an argument from the 90s, like 30 years ago. You're using an argument that's 30 years old and think you've got a big gotcha. No, you don't. You've got nothing. You've got an old gish argument that's been absolutely debunked. Well, did you know that there's not just one organism which is irreducibly complex, but there are many throughout the entire animal kingdom? But come on, Joe, you keep using this term irreducibly complex. What does it even mean? I just... uh, we, we know what it means. It's it's something that the creationists made up as, as, a, as a sort of thing to say, hey, evolution couldn't possibly happen. But they, they haven't found anything that's irreducibly complex. Put it simply to me, please. Okay, irreducible complexity is the argument that there is life, there are systems which have multiple parts which interact together, and if you remove just one of these parts, the entire system would not function. This obviously debunks evolution instantly, as according to the evolutionist, all life comes from a simple life form, and by small modifications, more complex systems can be gradually built by natural selection. But when a system is irreducibly complex, it needs every part to be fully developed for the system to work, which of course points away from an unguided guided process of millions of years, but points more towards the purposeful arrangements of all of the parts by an intelligent creator. Uh, the, the way that he talks as well, it, it points to intelligence. Yeah, I mean, he's got irreducible complexity down. It's just we haven't, we haven't shown anything to be irreducibly complex. This is the thing. Um, I might skip past this explanation because we all understand what irreducible complexity is, probably better than they do. Applies to this yeah, they, this is sort of, he talks about a drill is irreducibly complex, which is is ridiculous because a drill doesn't have children. And this is the thing. Um, but he talks about a mousetrap. And this is one of the things that I want to show. This is um, Behe's sort of, oh, a mousetrap. But actually in the, the Kitzville versus Dover, where, where Behe got thoroughly, thoroughly debunked and absolutely spanked, was that someone wore the, the, um, the, the, the um the hammer there 
right? So the hammer section as a tie clip. And he had like the, the rest of it in different places. And he basically said, well, this, this is where you can use the different parts for other things. It doesn't have to be the same thing. Because if I use this as a tie clip and I use the spring as something, something else and the, the, the base as something else, I can actually put them together um, over time to make um, a, a, a mousetrap. It's not irreducibly complex. It's only irreducibly complex if it has to be a mousetrap, if it has to be a mousetrap. And this is this has been absolutely demonstrated. Functional in a different context. See when I take this out is that this is a mousetrap from which I've removed two of the parts. I've removed the catch and the base hold. You can't catch any mice with this. But these three parts of the five-part mousetrap are perfectly functional in a different context. And one context would be holding my pie on. Another context would be serving as a large paper clip. They might be able to criticize Behe's mousetrap illustration, but very few have struggled to explain just how the phalegian motor evolved. Can you guys believe it? Can you guys believe this? Can you believe this? He's going to the bacterial flagellum. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he is. Nobody has been able to, to talk about the bacterial flagellum. Are you serious right now? So Kitzville versus Dover was a famous one where um, Behe came in using the bacterial flagellum as a, a example of irreducible complexity. And it was actually pointed out that there was an injectosome that that had the same um, the same sort of thing. So something used for inject injecting things um, as the same um, structure as the bacterial flagellum minus a few parts. So it wasn't irreducibly complex. And and Behe absolutely got egg on his face for that one. I think the best, well, the most visually striking example of design is something called the bacterial flagellum. Now, th this is a figure of a bacterial flagellum taken from a textbook, which is widely used in colleges and universities around the country. The bacterial flagellum is quite literally an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim. And in order to accomplish that function, it has a number of parts which are ordered to that effect. Now, this part here, which is labeled filament, is actually the propeller of the bacterial flagellum. The motor is actually a rotary motor. And most people who see this and have the function explained to them quickly realize that these. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, and, and we've got examples and I'll just look it up. Uh, I did have this linked. Yeah, there we go. So this is the um, bacterial flagellum and a type 3 injectosome system. Um, they are almost, almost identical. Right, and this is used for injection of things. So with slight modification, you can actually make a flagellum out of an injectosome, something for injecting things. Um, you know, with, with even just a slight, a slight modification, um, you know, and, and these can be steps like one after another. It doesn't have to just change all in one go. It, 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 this is the thing. They think that, these things, like there was a, one of them that didn't have this, and suddenly they have it. And that's not true. That's not, um, you know, and, and it, 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 they're both sort of, they, they share a secretion system. And look at all of these parts that are exactly the same. And then you have other systems which, you know, sort of have the properties of both, but they're not as developed as either. We understand how this works. And, and quite frankly, um, Behe was absolutely, absolutely um, debunked. He, like this, this, this sort of, like, I haven't heard anybody use the bacterial flagellum for ages because of, because of this. But, I mean, it, it doesn't matter to these people. Um, 
but these parts are ordered for a in a sense um, could only have uh, come about as a whole in other words it's very unlikely they could have come about through just a kind of uh, contingent combination of parts over even millions or billions of years but rather in a sense had to be created whole cloth all together at once because everything fits together so well that to remove one part the thing wouldn't function let's examine a yeah and that's that's not how it works that's that's not how it works um yeah much larger system the giraffe giraffes are actually so this is hilarious he's going to the giraffe I mean, this is ridiculous. You know, I, I don't know why he's going to the giraffe because the giraffe has, if you remember, a very cool thing that shows evolution has problems sometimes. Actually, very strong evidence that animals did not gradually evolve over millions of years. You already know that giraffes have six foot long necks, but did you know that every time a giraffe does this, it could be potentially over for our long necked friends? It it could be turned, and I love his use of graphics. Yeah, the the yeah. Um, uh, Robin, oh, thank you so much, Robin. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, where is it? Where have you gone, Robin? You sniper, what you done now? And you hit Jeff. Oh, there you go, Jeff. Welcome, welcome. Enjoy all your emotes. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Uh, enjoy the emotes. Have a bonk. Have a, have a bonk, mate. There you go. Wow, nice shot. That's uh that's uh that's very good. I Robin impresses me. Not just just for her uh aim but yeah. So yeah, it, it it's the whole idea is that if the giraffe died while leaning over, we wouldn't have giraffes. It would be sort of part of the 99% of of organisms that have gone extinct. Like, if, if it wasn't suited, it would not be here. If, and the big if is, they were not designed by an intelligent designer. The fact is this, each giraffe has a 25 pound heart. Why is it so big? Well, the giraffe's heart has a very trying job to do. It has to pump a huge amount of blood all the way up the neck towards the head whilst working against gravity. Here is the problem with step-by-step -step evolutionary modification. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, What's the problem with step by step? What's the problem with it and its neck getting longer? And the giraffes that that had, say, bad circulation or or um, didn't have the necessary thing, they would die. They would die out. They wouldn't be as um, able to survive as the ones that did. There's no problem in evolution with this. Absolutely no problem whatsoever modifications because if the giraffe's mega heart is constantly pumping large amounts of blood to the head what happens when the giraffe bends its neck right down to drink from a water hole suddenly all of that power would of course rush an insane amount of blood and pressure to the giraffe's brain which would cause the giraffe at best to pass out and at worst well it doesn't bear thinking about because fortunately the giraffe was intelligently designed to be able to cope with this dilemma In yeah, it's not. And we can see that. Yeah, it's it's called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So good, good work, people. Um, it is a nerve that goes down from the um the the brain basically all the way down the neck, loops around the aorta of the heart and back up to, to cross a very, very small difference. In humans, it's only about this much difference. And and it basically loops around our aorta and back up. Now, I was in a debate with David McQueen, who's admittedly a geologist, but he sort of said, oh, no, there's things down there that the nerve has to um, has to perform. There's functions down there. That... No, there isn't. And he got this information off his very knowledgeable daughter, who's a physical therapist. So, you know, obviously she's an expert in the field of biology and, and you know, neurology. Um, so... Um, uh, yeah, good night, good night, Dave. Have a good one, mate. Um, the 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 whole idea that this has been designed is absolutely nonsense. There, there's no problem with the way that we see giraffes, and we even have um, sort of the giraffe genome. And this is this is great because um, gene analysis tells us how those adaptions came about. So if we look at sort of uh, this article is more than seven years old. Yeah, so is this bloody argument. Um, like, you know, we can see that the genes and and it's really related to the carpi 
um, sort of they broke off 28 million years ago. We can sort of see variations in, in the uh, genetics that can show how it developed. It's not like we don't understand this. It's not like people don't study this for a job. We understand how this happened. We've got um, the, the, the genome sequence that reveals um, that, so the Okapi, um, which I believe it had a, a picture here, yeah. So the Okapi, it has sort of a, a medium-sized neck and has some of the um, some of the features that the giraffe does. Like, this is the thing. He's bringing up examples where we understand how they evolved and going, they don't understand this. They absolutely do. They absolutely do. There's no problem with this whatsoever. No problem with this at all. But, you know, when you're using arguments that have been debunked from 30 years ago, I think you've got to take a good, hard look at yourself. I really do. You've got to look at yourself and go, hey, have I addressed the the explanations that they have given for these, these um, arguments? Because don't forget, here's the thing. If you're bringing up an old argument and it has been addressed, you need to address the refutations as well. You need to address the counters that they've given. But, you know, Joe Kirby, he's not interested in addressing refutations. He's interested in just bringing up this, these, these arguments, bringing up this hype, making these statements. And they're all false. They're all lies. They're all him just putting, putting stuff out. He just wants to put stuff out for the, the sake of doing it. Absolutely shocking. Inside every giraffe is an irreducibly complex system. The giraffe's blood vessels are unique in that they have reinforced walls with bypass valves, and these valves are instructed exactly when to open and when to close by sensor signals, which tell the giraffe whether to restrict the blood flow to the brain or to release it. But here's yeah, and and so the, the whole idea of of um, well, they're instructed to 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 think the way that he's phrasing it makes it sound like oh there's 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 this you know highly advanced computers no it's like saying we're instructed to eat by our sensor system yeah i mean if you want to put it like that you could alternatively say we get hungry because you know the 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 that's the way that that we operate like it, it's not like they're instructed in writing or something like come on now the, the way that he's phrasing it is so leaning towards creationism, it's ridiculous. But here's the real fingerprints of a creator on the giraffe. Supposing that these moderating blood vessels let a little bit too Hey, guess what, champ? We have valves in our system as well. It's not like things don't have valves. And yeah, the, the giraffe has a system in which it can close its valves under certain um, stimuli, but it's not like it's it's giving instructions to it. It just happens automatically because the ones that didn't, didn't survive. Bit too much blood through the bypass valves. What happens then? Well, I'm glad you asked because inside of the giraffe's head is a genius sponge-like design which absorbs too much blood and then releases the exact amount to the brain until the giraffe's blood pressure equalizes. Oh, and by the way, just a little throwaway comment here. Once the giraffe has refreshed its palate and lifts its head up, this complex system knows exactly how to work in reverse. So yeah, so see what he's saying? It knows. No, it doesn't know. It's like saying, hey. You know your your system knows that that you know it needs to open and close valves in your heart. No, it doesn't know. It's just it's just a system like any system. Oh, your your body knows when it has to release white blood vessels. It, no, it doesn't. It's just an autonomous system. Like it's it's so weird. You know, oh, your body knows that that it lacks water, so it. Well, I guess in a certain sense, but it is just autonomous. Like, it's not like it is thinking. It's not like it's going, oh, wait, I'm low on water. Well, I better send a, a you know, signal to, to be thirsty to the, to the person. That's not what's happening. It's not a conscious thing.
corpse, so then you don't get problems with too much blood then rushing away from the head. So, if you're an atheist, can I lovingly ask you a question? If Have you ever been lovingly asked a question by a Christian? Has anyone ever been lovingly asked a question? I mean, you can lovingly ask it. It, it, it sounds a bit sus when you put it like that, you know, like... I want to lovingly ask you a question. Like, what do you want to stroke my hair while you do it? What What are you talking about? You want to caress my cheek while while you ask your question? What are you talking about? If these systems were somehow the product of random, unguided evolution, it's not random and it's not unguided. It isn't random. The The next time I hear somebody say evolution is random, I am going to vomit blood. Um, and I want to give a big welcome to all the Matters Now people. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us. I am just about to vomit blood over the 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 somebody else saying that evolution is random. Evolution isn't random. Mutations are random. Um, mutations are random, but evolution is selection. It's natural selection as well as an few other mechanisms. It isn't random. The next time I I hear someone say evolution is random, I am going to literally scream, ah, yeah, what the hell? It isn't random. It's not random. How many giraffes do you think passed out until these features somehow new to evolve? The obvious answer. New to evolve. New to evolve. You know what? In the early days, probably some passed out. And guess what? They were eaten and they were no longer in the gene pool. How about that? Um, Maximiliano Vicia, thank you so much. And I will never mispronounce your name again, I swear. What a guy. Thank you so much. Um, five readerships. Let me see who, who are the victims. Um, what? Maximiliano Vicia was gifted a membership by Maximiliano Vicia? What the? You gifted one to yourself? It, should we count that one? Is that a gift? If you give something to yourself, is it a gift? I, like, let's count it. Let's count it anyway. Let, let's do it. Um, NetTube user, missing mod. Oh, we hit missing mod. Siddharth now. Congratulations, Siddharth. And Catherine MC. Congratulations. Winners, winners, chicken dinner. Enjoy your emotes. Uh, and enjoy, you know, like like Jefferson making trouble in the chat, making absolute trouble in the chat. Yeah, nice shot. Yeah, look, I, you know what? Maybe if you gift memberships, you gift one to yourself first. I think that would make sense, right? I, I think you should. That absolutely makes sense, because you know, really, if you don't have one, why would you gift it to other people? Quite frankly, I, I think that makes sense. So yeah. Or else it's just incredibly good luck. One of the two. Um, yeah, you're right, Jason. Anthropomorphizing things is is something that we do. We we absolutely well. I think people do in general. I think I think that it's not just very young children. I think that humans do in general. We kind of we hear a sound and we put it to a person or or some kind of anthropomorphic figure. I, I think we kind of do that inherently, um, rather than just natural causes. This answer is that the very first giraffe must have had these complex features already wired inside it, or they wouldn't have been able to survive and pass. Yeah, so here, here's the problem. What was the very first giraffe, right? When, when did a, um, a ancestor of the giraffe become the giraffe? Because when we look down, it's not this, and this is the way that they think that drives me crazy. It's like the something with a neck the size of an okapi suddenly just had a, had a huge neck. Like, it just, it, it gave birth to a, a massive giraffe. That is not what is happening. We're talking a very slow and gradual process. That it, It's like the change from Latin to, to French, for instance. There was no one person that suddenly just spoke French like just spoke another language. Like we, we don't, it's a gradual process. And, and the designation between um, a, a non-giraffe and a giraffe is kind of arbitrary. It's kind of like, well, we could put it here where they develop these series of traits, 
or we could put it back a bit where it developed these series of traits. It's not this hard and fast, well, you know, this this Okapi-looking ancestor just gave birth to a giraffe. That That isn't what we're saying. Um, uh. And pass on their genes and still be here today. I'm going to choose my words carefully now, because as I said in my Missing Link video, it is not my goal in any way to try and come across as smug or arrogant or to try and win an argument. No, I just very gently want to try and get people to think. Yeah, but you're giving out misinformation. You're giving out 30-year-old arguments that have been crushed. And crushed, I might add, in a court of law, refer to Kitzville of Mert versus Dover. It, it's, actually been, it's actually been debunked in the legal system like in in a in a court it's been debunked the, the the bacterial flagellum that you use has actually been thrown down in a court it's ridiculous like this is you may not be trying to provide misinformation but that's exactly what you're you're doing think whether you believe in evolution or not if you're totally honest with me right now you've got to agree that it does make sense for these complex systems to have an intelligent mind behind them. no it doesn't that's the thing you completely misrepresent these systems and then you say well you've got to agree with them no absolutely not and the examples you provided are not irreducibly complex they're not we understand the development of the bombardier beetle like secretionary system. We understand the development of the black bacterial flagellum from an injectosome. We understand the development of the, the um, um, giraffe cardiovascular system from the genetics of the giraffe and the okapi. We understand all of this stuff. Um, it, it, it's so bad behind them. The eye has a superior autofocusing system, more so than the best DLSR camera that you can buy in any shop. And yet how many of you would believe that a camera could build itself? Even the technology that we... Yeah, but a camera's like a mechanism. It, it's been built. Like, we understand how the eye evolved. Like, Richard Dawkins famously um, sort of provided that, that some some animals have less developed eyes. They have, you know, things that can see where light's coming from but not actually adjust. Like, we understand all of this. It, it's so weird. And yes, yeah, Star Song is right. The eye is wired backwards. We do have a blind spot because it, it isn't the best design. Um because we we of the way that it evolved. Um octopus eyes um and, and other cephalopod eyes evolved differently, and they don't have the blind spot that we all have today that right now we're a little bit fearful of this technology yes it knows how to recreate itself but it first had to be designed it first had to be instructed it first had to be fed information by an intelligent human mind what got you to that leap what got you to this information has to come from an intelligent mind i i don't know how he makes that argument he's basically saying hey this information has to come from a mind why why? I, I don't understand why. Mind, or else it wouldn't be here today. So why is it we are told to believe that our eight billion minds, smart thinking minds, came from no minds? Why are we told our smart thinking minds came from no minds? Why would we think that the cars came from no cars? Why would we think that plants came from no plant? And you know what? Not all organisms have minds. And we have a series. Here's the thing. Minds seem to be a product of the brains. And as brains get more complex, we see greater complexity in minds. There are, you know, things like jellyfish, which don't have brains and they don't have minds. They just react to whatever's around them. Same with other organisms like starfish and, and you know, plants and things. They don't, they don't think, they just react. Like, it, it's so weird that you're sort of going... Well, minds came from no minds. So, what? What? It's like brains came from no brains. Yeah. Like we see a greater and greater complexity of the nervous system and the associated sort of structures in the brain. Like it's a very, very complex um, sort of evolution of the nervous system.
I, I don't I don't know why. This is sort of an argument from incredulity. Oh well, I can't believe that a mind came from no mind. Great. Why? Do you have anything to back that up, or is that just yeah? Why are we told to believe that our conscious mind came from the unconscious? These are serious questions. That... And, and to, here's the thing. Why does he talk like this? Does anybody know? Like, okay, so I got this and I grabbed this um, this thing. This man does not talk like this ordinarily. So this is a um, Ray Comfort an, an interview that he did. Listen to this. Let's go back to open air preach anyway before we both get uh, <laughs> in trouble. Uh, she's called Emma. Emma. Hi, Emma. You're doing a good job. Skinny camera there. Hi, Ray. Thanks. <laughs> you hear that, yeah. Yeah. Oh, she sounds pretty. Yeah, she's camera shy. Yeah. Um, anyway, so let's talk about. So we've got George Whitfield. We've got um, we've got Charles Spurgeon. We've got. Okay, so so listen to that. That's him talking normally. So why is it that he goes to this the, these videos and he talks like this and all of the things that it, it's like this. Um, he wants to sound like he has this special knowledge, like he has this this sort of, you know, um, um, almost this air of mystery. I have knowledge that you don't. I have information. It's almost like someone talking to a child, you know. Oh, well, we don't know why this occurs. We just know it occurs, sweetie. You know, th this is sort of, that's him normally. This is so fake and so put on, it's ridiculous. Like, listen to this now. Questions that I believe every atheist must have an answer for. Because every atheist must have an answer for. Yeah, he, he's basically putting on this, well, I'm talking to you like a child because I understand that you don't know this stuff. So I'm explaining to you what it is. Could you be any more condescending? That is so condescending. But, yeah, Gigi, I agree. A fake guru. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because if they are wrong, well, the Bible is clear. They will one day meet the God that they have rejected and they will bow to his son. But my dear friends, listen to Well, I've never seen someone go from irreducible complexity into Pascal's wager with that much speed and lack of... of reason like why and plus you don't know that the bible is right about that you don't know that the bible will just because it says one thing we don't know that is the case you haven't demonstrated that listen to me because anyone who can hear my voice right now is not without hope there is no one who is too far gone why because god the father came up with a wonderful salvation plan which is irreducibly complex <laughs> the, the, the salvation plan is irreducibly complex yeah you heard that you heard that all right irreducibly complex salvation plan i i why is this why is sending yourself down to earth to be killed and then using that to forgive people irreducibly complex. I, I don't understand. I am so baffled. Like, surely he could have done without, you know, two of the apostles. Why do you need 12? I don't, I don't. Surely he could have done without Thomas. Wouldn't the plan just be as complex without Thomas? I, I don't know. It's so weird. How is this how is this irreducibly complex? I, I'd love for someone to explain to me this. Please. How how does irreducibly complex apply to the the the, the salvation of humanity? I've been thinking about this. Because if you think about our salvation, if any part of it was lies. You've never thought about anything. No, I'm being mean. I'm, I'm just being mean now. Look, look up what you're saying. It, it's it's not hard to do a little bit of background checking and find out, like from scientific sources, whether these things are actually irreducibly complex or not. And now you're saying, 
Oh, God's salvation plan is irreducibly complex. I of it was removed. Any of these interacting parts came away, then the plan would not work. So everyone take this into Oh, so I'm sorry. So the all powerful creator of the universe has no other way to make the plan work except for exactly what he did. So he is limited, absolutely limited to this one series of events. And there's no other possible way we could ever make that work. The infinitely powerful creator of the universe has only one option available to them. I'm, I'm calling BS. Like, that does not make any sense whatsoever. Just as an internal critique. I mean, I don't think there is an all-powerful creator of the universe. But why is he limited to this one series of events? I, I, and why is it irreducibly complex? What, if, if Jesus didn't curse the, the olive tree? Suddenly it doesn't work? What the hell? Take this into your mind and stop me if I get something wrong. Because you and I... Oh, I will, buddy. I've been stopping you every time you've got something wrong. I've been stopping you constantly because you've got stuff wrong. ...have messed up. We have tried to run the show ourselves. We have broken God's laws. And therefore, we have accumulated a huge debt of sins which we cannot pay off. So yeah, so straight into the preaching. Just, just uh, irreducible complexity to um, Pascal's wager to preaching with irreducible complexity for some reason i'm not i'm not sure why because it doesn't really make sense but sure sure i so the first thing we need is someone to pay off our sins that's the first part however it's no good having any old joe to write off our debts this person has to be perfect why why can't any old joe write off our sin like why i, I don't it's so weird they have to be without sin, otherwise they would first have to pay off their own sins before they could save any of us. And that is the second part. Now, according to the scripture, for us to be forgiven, blood has to be spilt. The Bible... In order for us to... This is what sort of makes it a blood cult. That in order for us to be... Like, sort of, this goes back to the, the scapegoat or, or putting your sins onto an animal and then killing that animal kind of thing. It's all very primitive and, and very... Um, uh, sort of, it, it, it reminds you of those things where people believe that they could um, put their um, put their shortcomings onto something and kill it, and symbolically that would relieve them of whatever their shortcomings are. It it, it is mired in this this sort of blood cult um, um, thing that someone has to sort of die to take away your sins. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It also says, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no... Re really? Uh, blood not commonly known for its purifying mechanisms there. Um, you know, try, try something better. Try, try industrial clean or bleach or something, like seriously. Yeah, th this is just, just preaching. This is just preaching. Oh, remission. So someone had to shed their blood to wash away, to scrub away our guilty stains of sin. That's the third part. And this is this is the problem with Christianity. It basically tells you that you're broken and that you have to believe in order to be fixed. And that's not how any of it works. Um, when we do things wrong, when we when we when we screw up, when we when we feel bad about things. Sort of just just believing in some someone died to, to take that off you it isn't isn't really healthy. It isn't really what you should do. Okay, but what good is forgiveness if we just die? If there is no paradise after this life? So what do we need now? Well, we need someone who can empty our grave and give us eternal life. Someone who has the power to conquer death and not only raise themselves from the dead, but everyone who trusts in him. That's the fourth part. But friends, here's another thing. For is Jesus going around digging up graves? Is that what's going to happen? He's just going to go around and dig us all up and, and you know, is... Is 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 Jesus is Jesus okay? Is is this is this is really weird? 
Like he's kind of, I, I think he may be thinking of a bodily resurrection where your bodies get resurrected as well, which is kind of odd. It's kind of weird. Another thing for us to consider in our irreducibly complex salvation plan. How do we get to heaven when we are down here on earth? We need heaven to come down to us. We need this risen one to come back like a groom meets his bride. We need this person to rescue us, to deal with all those who hate him and hate his words. We need this person to come and collect himself, a people for himself, and to bring us before the throne of God, where we will worship the Father and work for him in all of eternity. That is the fifth part. So come on now, here's the moment of truth. Who is this one? Who is the only one who can weave together this irreducible? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know why, you know, I, it, it is stock video madness. You're right, Gigi. Um, I, I don't know why God wants this anyway. Like, I don't know why, what's the point of it? If, if, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to have any point. Um, like why does God, why does the, all-powerful God need worship anyway. Shouldn't need anything. Ah, I don't know. It's very strange. But we've we've gone totally into preaching, and this is sort of what um, off the curb does. He kind of makes these claims and makes these awful kind of scientific statements and these awful things that are are misinformation and incorrect information. And then he preaches at the end of it. It's very simple mechanisms that he's trying to do. Like just get you, get people to go, oh yeah, that that theory doesn't make any sense, and then listen to the sermon at the end. Reducibly complex salvation plan. It is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for wretched sinners like me, for a wretched sinner like you, who on the cross paid the price for our sins, took all of our debts in his body, who was then put in a tomb, but on the third day rose from the dead. After raising himself back to life, he went and ascended, and now he is at the right hand of God. But one day he's coming back to collect for himself a people, a bride for himself that will worship him in spirit and in truth. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to be like consent people. I don't want to be Jesus's bride. I, I don't, especially if he's some kind of, you know, grave digging um, um, necrophile there. I, I don't want to be the bride of Jesus if he's if he's some kind of some kind of grave digging um, necromancer with a, with a, you know, body fetish i i really don't i i this is not cool i i you know and, and none of this has been demonstrated none of this like this is just his assertion this is just him it's wishful thinking it, it all is wishful thinking and don't forget don't forget um he is basing this on not understanding how the bacterial flagellum came about don't forget that. That's where he's going, and and how the giraffe evolved, and and how um, the bombardier beetle evolved its defense mechanism, because it isn't that we don't understand it. It's just he doesn't understand it. He he has ignored that and in truth for all of eternity. There is none other than the man, Jesus Christ, who we must worship, and he alone can save us. But there is a final part to this irreducibly complex salvation plan, and it involves you, you yourself, have to be a willing participant. As the old saying... Oh, I'm special. I I'm special. I, I don't know how much uh, more of this, this preaching I can get through. I've got to be honest with you, people. This is just sort of, um, you know, and, and he kind of puts, puts that at the, the end of stuff goes god only helps those who want to help themselves and if you don't want this salvation plan well god will not push it on you no god gently draws people to himself but if you say no he respect your wishes so can i ask you a question that perhaps how do you know how, how does he know that the, the, look the god of the old testament was anything but gentle like it you know he was a vengeful angry god I don't know what this change of heart is. I, yeah. That perhaps you've never, ever thought about. Do you actually want to be saved? Do you actually want your sins to be forgiven? Do you actually want to, to turn away from all these false gods that you've trusted in and now trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? So technically, this is, this is an argument from consequence. It's like, do you want this to happen? If you want it, therefore it's true. 
And that's not how anything works. This is wishful thinking, regardless of what I want. Reality will be what it is, okay? Whether I want it or not is absolutely irrelevant. It doesn't matter what I want. The question is, is it true? And I'm seeing tons of this, like, um, well, don't you want to go to heaven? I'm interested in whether it's true, not whether I want it. Because I'm not interested in deluding myself in order to feel better. I want to know reality, not this, this fairy tale land that people often convince themselves to live in. Where, you know, they have a good marriage when their marriage is, is terrible and needs work. Where they have a great job where, you know, they're being absolutely abused by their boss. You know, living in this fantasy world is not good in the long run. It may be a, a good coping mechanism on short term, but it is not great in the long run. You can have a better life if you stop living in fantasy. And that's all that it is. What do you, what do you want to be true? You know, well, I want to be a superhero, but it's just, it's not reality. Come on now. That's not how anything works. Christ, do you actually want eternal life? Because whether you want eternal life or not, you'll get it. You'll either get it with the evil one for all of eternity in hell, or you'll get it with the Lord Jesus Christ for all of eternity in heaven. Oh, my dear friends. What yeah, and how do you show that? That's just sort of a, you know, assertion. He's just basically saying, yes, it's true because it's true because it's true. Uh, Whatever your thoughts are on evolution, this is not a salvation issue, but there is an issue of your soul and your sin, and that is no fairy tale. Whether you think all of these things... It absolutely is a fairy tale. It absolutely is. W what have you actually done to back up any of this stuff? Like, any of it? Oh, gee, I don't understand how the Bombardier Beetle came about. Therefore, heaven or hell for you and your soul, which I haven't demonstrated either. Does the Bombardier Beetle have a soul? Who knows? Because we can't actually define what it is. We can't actually find this thing. These things in the Bible are fairy tales. Your sin is not a fairy tale, and you need it dealing with right now. So please. Oh, here comes the guilt. Yeah, no, there's. I, I don't even believe in sin. It's not like I don't think that I haven't done things that are wrong, morally speaking. But this idea of sin is so harmful, like that if I think something wrong, then I'm a bad person. It's shame. You are just leveraging shame on people, and it's terrible. Stop it. People do stuff wrong. It's okay. That doesn't make you a bad person. It just means you're a fallible human like everybody else. And, you know, oh, but Jesus wasn't fallible. Prove it. Prove that. The only way you can prove it is referring to the Bible. So the the his his followers' books say he was perfect. Well, that's just fantastic, isn't it? So his fan club says he's perfect, so he's perfect. Well, great. Do we have any other references? No. Except for, you know, of course, the uh, the the people around at the time who who sort of said he was a, a horrible person. Um, you know, the Sanhedrin said he was a horrible person. But I get that they had their perspective as well. Maybe he was just a guy. Please turn to God in faith and repentance and let him wash away all of your sins and give you eternal life give you hope beyond the grave. Under normal circumstances, at this point in the video, I would address those who are saved. And I would say, if you're a Christian, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Now, yes, if you are one, please do consider joining our Off The Curve family. But right now, there's something far more important than that. I believe there are still some atheists watching my video, right? He knows. Quick, everybody, he knows. Run. Run, he knows we're watching. Run. Get out while you can right now and you're still unconvinced you're saying to me okay joe you want to say that I, i'm not unconvinced i am convinced you are wrong i'm i'm going in the opposite way from everything that you've said i am more convinced that there is no god from your terrible arguments the bombardier beetle debunked the the bacterial flagellum debunked in a court of law 
the the mouse trap absolutely debunked and the giraffe i haven't heard that one before but not a great argument especially with the recurrent laryngeal nerve that really shows evolution in the giraffe like literally its long neck and that nerve is really one of the key points where we know that evolution happened um wow wow to say that this world had a designer and it was all created but the big question needs to be asked who created god that, that's not the big question does god exist in the first place is the big question can you demonstrate do you have evidence of this god existing is the big question not who created God. Like that, the, the who created God question should only start to be asked if we actually demonstrate there is a God, which you haven't done. There. Well, if you want an answer to that question, you probably should check this out. And, and sort of, so who created God? Probably humans created God, I would say. That, that would be my guess. We made it up. We made it up. We, we do a lot of those things. Who created all the other gods? See, this is the thing. It, it's sort of that he thinks that humans created every god except his. Of the parade of thousands and thousands and thousands of gods that have, have come across the human race, all of them have been made up by humans except for the one he happens to believe in. That one's real. And, you know, the Muslim over there, they think all of the other gods have been made up by humans except for Allah. And the, the Hindu guy is saying all the other gods have been made up except for this, you know, Shiva and the rest of and Vishnu and all of the rest of the other Hindu gods. It's not a great leap to go, hey, maybe your god was made up by humans as well. And they put in a book that it was perfect and it had all these attributes to it and all this stuff. And you're, you're, the argument that um, because we don't know where the Bombardier beat or how it evolved, well, number one, we do know. And number two, even if we didn't know, it doesn't entail a God. It doesn't. As I've said to people before, what if aliens design the Bombardier Beetle? Why does that necessitate a god? What if it was it was genetically designed by a bunch of super intelligent aliens? That's not God. But it's not natural selection either. But but we, we know how it evolved. It's not it's not a big ask. But this is um yeah, this is Joe Kerb and, and he's kind of huge and um, somebody said he really hates him. I don't hate him. I, what did you say that I hate him or, or really dislikes him? Um, doesn't like this guy. No, I, I don't like him. I think that he does a lot that's just sort of peddling misinformation and conspiracy theories and, and sort of um, unscientific things in order to try to... Um, to, to show that there's a God. And, and really, it's just a segue for his preaching that he goes into with this. And I think it's his, his, the, the way that he condescends to people that's particularly egregious to me, like pre, sort of pretending he has this, this, oh, I have this knowledge, when sort of going through his actual sort of demonstration, you can, you can absolutely pick it apart. You can absolutely find out that it's just, a con it's just it's just him trying to sound like he's the parent and you're the child and he's educating you in these amazing things um and that's the only way i can compare it to like when you you talk to a child and you go no jimmy no we shouldn't touch the the whatever because there's germs on it and what germs are are germs that, that that is the way that he talks but he doesn't like he's giving wrong information he's giving information literally from 30 years ago that has been absolutely demolished by scientists like absolutely demolished and not only demolished sort of on youtube or something demolished in a court of law where scientists came on and and um, Behe had to admit 
that he has no evidence for intelligent design. No evidence. Like he cannot, B, he had to admit he cannot produce a single paper supporting intelligent design. He had to admit that in court or perjure himself. He's got no evidence for it. But, you know, come 2024, we're using arguments from 1992, like 30 plus years ago. Because one thing I've noticed that these people do is they go to an old argument. It doesn't work. Someone will point it out. They will drop it and they will resurrect it like Jesus rising from the grave after sufficient time has passed and try and use it again, and try and use it again. And I guess it works on the people that don't investigate his claims and don't look into it. But, you know, th this is the thing that we're trying to promote. Educate people in this stuff. Get them to know that, hey, the bacterial flagellum, that is an argument that has long since died. You know, I've found that it happens the same on, on you know, Donnie's channel, Sam Trick. He'll just bring up stuff that's already been debunked. I think Guts and Gibbon made an excellent video about it. The merry-go-round that we're on with these people and their arguments where they'll bring up an argument, it gets totally debunked, they'll let it sit for, you know, a few years and then it'll come up again. And, and you know, she gets, and, and I totally understand, she gets this, like, I'm sure I've addressed this before. And it would be fine. Like, don't get me wrong. It would be fine if they're bringing up the refutation as well and presenting something to overcome that refutation from the scientific community. But they're not. They're just bringing up the original argument. Please stop. Stop doing this. Not, not only for um, the sake of our sanity, but also it's not going to win people to you. Because how do people trust you if um, you, you keep bringing up the same arguments again and again that, that fall down? It, it's not. Oh, she did? Oh, good stuff. Oh, she should put up done. Look, I'm, I'm a big fan of Erica. I think Erica is amazing. Um, you know, and I think she's very honest and enthusiastic and a genuine person. I think that, um, she, you know, she doesn't, um, have this this problem of bringing up refuted, bringing up this kind of stuff. She she's honest about her inquiries. Um, I I think that she's she's amazing. So yeah, good on her. Um, that that's great. I, I love it. Um, but look, I've had my rant. This has been fundamentalist fails, and you realize why we call it fails. This entire video was failure after fact like th this entire video was rehashing arguments that have so horrendously failed in the past that you know the apologists generally don't bring them up because they absolutely have failed but you know you get people like this who will bring them up and then preach at people and i'm sure his his captive audience goes oh yeah 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 Educate yourself a little. It's not. It's not cool. Anyway, I'm gonna. I'm gonna dash. I know this has been a short one, but I, I kind of expected this to go longer. I'm not sure why. Um, it, like, Curb's weird. He's he's a weird one. He's definitely a weird one. And and the way that he talks to people is just odd because it, it 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 isn't the way that he talks in real life. It isn't. It isn't. You know, he isn't being genuine. He is playing a part. Um, oh, thank you, Robin. Yeah, please click, click the like. Um, it, it's really, really, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, I will be doing, um, so Eastern time, Saturday night, um, Sunday morning, my time, I will be back here with another debate to section. Uh, we're going through uh, a debate. Um, I think I'm going to be going through the um, George Pell um Dan Barker debate because one of them's Australian um, and I really hate George Pell. So if you want to see me get fired up, probably that's going to be the time to, to see it. So um, thank you for joining me, everybody. And as always, don't forget, 
be kind to yourself, be kind to each other, and uh, do have a good day. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you.